Thank you, Art, and thanks to the DDP. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, thanks to Willie Soon, I found out that uh, if I would just eat more mercury, I'd have a little bit more hair. I think that's what his talk is about, but I get confused. Uh, anyway, you could start that. Uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of a movie. It won't take long. Uh, carefully observe, man comes in there and he gets this thing operating. That's called a compound pendulum, which distinguishes it from a simple pendulum, which is simply a ball operating on a string. Now he's turning it into a double compound pendulum by removing a screw there that's holding two lengths to stick together. Your job, should you decide to accept it, is to follow the motion. All right, that's enough. We can stop it there and then go on with the talk. Um, well, what you just saw was two sticks. The physics is not in question. Your computer cannot solve that problem. And you're going to do what with the climate? <laughs> That's even worse than two sticks. Anyway, uh, I'm going to be talking about using data noise to combat political noise. And the political noise I'm talking about is stuff that you read in the newspapers all the time. Al Gore says, yes, in fact, in 20 to 50 years, the World Trade Center mem memorial site would be underwater. Uh, that's a present future fact. Or is it a future present fact? I don't know. <clears throat> Some things, fact and future, are not go-togethers. Uh, <clears throat> Bob Carter happens to be a superb uh, geologist in, from Australia, and uh, he's spent his uh, entire academic career boring into the uh, seafloor uh, studying past climate. Um, but somebody called Static, who is a um, uh, climate alarmist says that idiot geologist from a third-rate university in a second-rate country. Time, Michael Lemonic, only a handful of the most doctrinaire diehards still dispute the idea that human activity is heating up the planet. Now, there's no climate uh, skeptic that I know of that denies that there is some heating effect due to carbon dioxide and some heating effect due to land use, and certainly there is the urban heat island effect. But uh, this guy is uh, rather a little doctrinaire himself. News, this is a news cover, a Newsweek cover. Well-funded naysayers, like us, yeah, um, who still reject the overwhelming evidence of climate change. Now, who has denied climate change? Nobody. Inside the denial machine, NBC's Ann Thompson, deniers are confusing the issue and delaying solutions. The scientific debate is no longer over society's role in global warming. Uh, it is a matter of degrees. <coughs> Thomas Friedman, they, ExxonMobil, are bad, bad guys because of what they're doing in, flight, in fighting the science of global warming. Chuck Schumer believes climate change legislation is vital to our energy, uh, uh, <coughs> energy future. And James Hansen, of course, who is the uh, <coughs> uber alarmist. The fate of humanity and nature may depend upon early recognition and understanding of human-made effects on Earth's climate. I'm showing you here a picture of the temperature and CO2 record ex, uh, covering 600 million years, which is the last only 15% of the age of the Earth. Here we have atmospheric CO2 uh, in this black line, and, uh, and over here this blue line is the uh, temperature. Now those are long-term averages. Notice the, globe, the temperature has gone down quite a bit here. And <clears throat> if you have a keen eye, you might notice that there are some dips in this temperature curve. 
But the first thing is that on this time scale, CO2 is just plain unrelated to temperature. Here we've got uh, uh, temperature going down, CO2 being very high, and so forth. But <clears throat> we take that part away, and I want to point out that there are some 150 million year periods uh, uh, between those dips in the Earth's temperature. And it turns out that those are times when we are within the arms of the Milky Way, and these times when the temperature is high is when we are not within the arms of the Milky Way. But uh, we're not going to be discussing a whole lot about that. We're going to be discussing some things during the present ice age. Some people in New York might think we're not in an ice age at the present time. <clears throat> but uh, here's uh, on a whole different time scale. Now that one, uh, let's see here, this one went back 600 million years. Uh, this one goes back 500,000 years. In other words, it's the previous curve comp uh, stretched by a factor of a thousand more or less, zero to 500,000 million years, or 500,000 years ago, it's half million. These are glacial periods. These are interglacials, that's the present. And uh, so we are in one very, very long ice age and we're spending 90% of the time uh, in these glacial periods. But over Phanerozoic time, by the way, this zoic has to do with life. That word just means all time when life has existed on Earth. Temperature and CO2 are uh, uncorrelated. Other phenomena dominate the uh, climate, <clears throat> but that doesn't mean that the laws of physics don't apply. There is some physics in here, which becomes important on short time scales. I'm going to only consider about the last century or so. Or so. But now I'm going to show you how to make some eye candy, or eye pollution, if you really like it. Uh, here's a, a graph showing CO2 concentration versus time since about 1850 or so. And there's a picture of uh, one of the climate alarmists known as Kevin Trenberth. But you know, we don't really need that whole graph because the only important part is up here, so we'll get snippy and cut it off. <coughs> and then we'll stretch it. Now, this idea is not original with me. It, uh, any of you who have ever read um, the uh, How to Lie with Statistics by Daryl Huff, that's many, many decades old now, will recognize the uh, technique. He, he did it with a comic figure. I did it with a comic figure. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I got some data from Willie Soon, and I'm going to show this in the next several graphs. Uh, he's, he keyed me into where I could find the solar flux data, and I got the temperature data from NASA GIS, and in these several graphs, I'm going to be showing their time series running from about 18 or about 1880 on, and on the left-hand side, you'll see the solar flux in watts per square meter, and on the right-hand side, you'll see the temperature anomaly. And you can see that right now the, the temperature is holding awfully constant, but the solar flux is varying all over the place. No, no, wait. I'm going to take the same data and plot them a different way. Uh, now you can see that the solar flux is remaining pretty constant, but the temperature is varying all over the place. Uh, let's go to a logarithmic scale. <clears throat> there's, the there's the solar flux. There's the there's no correlation at all. <clears throat> and uh, see, I even stretched this uh, solar scale, this logarithmic solar scale, and uh, it still shows that uh, the uh, flux is remaining constant and the temperature is varying all over the place. And now I'm going to squeeze the graph the other way and look at that temperature rise. Uh, we're going to die, and the, temp and the sun has got nothing to do with it. Ah, okay. Now here's a graph from Willie Soon, <clears throat> who's uh, talked about the, uh, the, again, it's a time series here. He's got the solar flux over here, and he's got the, the uh, uh, temperature variation over there. And he's showing a pretty good looking correlation, but that's Arctic wide, the air surface temperature anomaly. And I'm going to take the uh, uh, temperature data from NASA GISS. <clears throat> 
And the solar data from Hoyt and Shatton, which is the group that uh, Willie put me on to, and the, again, the, this case, temperature is over here, the solar flux is over here, and that begins to look like a correlation. But uh, what I'm going to insist is that uh, these are time series, and time series, as you can see, can be made to look like anything that you want to by the appropriate choice of uh, axes. They're useful and necessary, but time is a parameter. Time is not a cause. We're interested in cause-effect graphs. <laughs> time wounds all heals. Cause-effect graphs. Now, we've already seen several cause-effect graphs in here. And what would you think of a pharmaceutical company that tried to license a drug through the FDA and didn't present them with various cause-effect graphs? Actually, the Kaplan-Meier curve is a, uh, is a uh, time series in a way. Uh, but if you have five-year survival, one-year survival, various kinds of graphs and so forth, you, you graph up the results of um, <clears throat> the effect versus the dose. Okay, there's dose effect curves and so forth. Uh, but those are just, their cause effect graphs. So now I'm going to use Willie's uh, solar data again here. And there are the year by year data. There's the year, there's the solar flux. The temperature anomaly was recorded in uh, hundreds of a degree C. We'll translate that into uh, just degree C. And then we're going to say that the cause is the rise in the solar flux from some arbitrary point, and the effect is the rise in temperature from that same arbitrary point. In other words, we get this rise in solar flux by subtracting the current value of solar flux from the initial value of solar flux, which I took to be 1880. I get the 0.12 by subtracting this number from this one. And the temperature anomaly I get by subtracting this number from this one it turns out to be 0 0.05. You go on, you have a graph, you have a table of cause and effect. So you plot it. Here's the increase in solar flux, which we take to be the cause. Here's the increase in uh, temperature, which we take to be the effect. And we get a graph that looks like that. Decently linear. <clears throat> Noise. First thing to notice is that this straight line explains, as it were, 48% uh, of the variation. It does not establish uh, causality because, after all, um, either one could, in principle, be the cause. But we suspect rather strongly that the uh, temperature on the Earth doesn't have a whole lot to do with the solar flux coming from the sun. Okay, the other thing is there's a lot of noise in here, just the, point, the scatter of the points. And that says the solar flux is not the whole, the whole story. So what about CO2 and temperature? Now that is the issue, is it not? People say CO2 is causing problems, causing the temperature to rise and so forth. That is the issue, right? So now we're going to ask you to make a prediction. Here's temperature rise, chose, uh, considered as an effect, carbon dioxide concentration as cause. Do you expect just random points? Constructed the same way as I constructed the Willy Soon graph. Do you expect to see a straight line like this? Do you expect to see a hockey stick kind of graph? Do you expect to see this? And it's what do you expect? Well, anyway, we're going to set a high school student to work because a high school student can be convinced, or at least back in the old days, might be convinced to make a graph and take a bunch of points. So he says, OK, the uh, CO2 has an effect on temperature. The cause is CO2 concentration. The effect is temperature. 
This is not a very sophisticated kid. He said, hey, I learned how to make a graph. Why don't I just go ahead and make one? I've got the CO2 data and the temperature data, both from NASA GIS. So I make a graph. There's the temperature anomaly. It's not temperature, but it's temperature anomaly. It's good enough for the kind of people I run around with. <clears throat> CO2 concentration there and gets a pretty good line. Uh, his teacher notices this thing is slightly bent over and he says maybe that's a logarithmic dependence. If his teacher knew anything about logarithms. If you don't remember much about logarithms, there's a cartoon once upon a time in BC in Wiley's Dictionary. Logarithm is a system used by a Catholic lumberjack to control the size of his family. <laughs> okay, now here's a more sophisticated view. <laughs> uh, there's a logarithmic dependence in there, and um, the uh, IPCC says that there is some forcing that is proportional to a logarithm, and I'll tell you what that logarithm is in a moment. And the temperature is proportional to the forcing, perhaps. Now, for this one right in here, they have a constant, which is 5.35 watts per square meter. This one, they put in a Greek letter, an alpha. And the product of a presumably known number and an unknown number is an unknown number. So I'll put that up here. So here is what, what the IPCC would get if they would combine those two coefficients. This is derived from the IR spectrum. And uh, it, it looks like this, that the temperature rise, which is T minus T zero, is directly proportional to the logarithm of C over C zero, where C zero is tied to T zero. For example, you go back to 1880, that's gonna be my starting point. At that time, the, log the concentration was 283.64, whatever, parts per million by volume. The temperature was whatever it was. And uh, so we can actually measure, we, we, have, we can construct tables of delta T and that logarithm. And by the way, about this equation, this equation is an empirical one, basically, that uh, pertains to present concentration of CO2 and present temperature both. And that equation would be totally worthless at, say, 20 parts per million by volume. And it would be uh, totally worthless at t equals 100 C. Because, well, I'm not going to go into those reasons, but this is a short-range empirical formula. But anyway, uh, it is incumbent upon us to do the obvious plot. In other words, plot this delta t versus that CO2 uh, log ratio. Obvious? What's obvious about that? It's not at all obvious to climate alarmists. They have never made the graph. Never. But they call themselves scientists. <clears throat> now, here is that graph. Going back to 1880, temperature rise since 1880, the CO2 ratio since 1880, a logarithm of it there. You get a nice straight line, that's the data from 130 years, has a slope, and it has an R squared value of 81%, which means the correlation coefficient, since this is a linear function, is 90%. Pretty darn good. First thing to notice is from the slope, we have delta T equals 2.884 degrees C, log C over C zero. For CO2 doubling, which is something that the climate uh, people like to talk about, they talk about the sensitivity to doubling. Now, were it not for that logarithmic function, the doubling would be a totally meaningless phenomenon, right? Okay, so we'll let, CO, let the concentration double. That means C over C zero is equal to two. 2.884 times the natural log of two, which is 0.69315 is 2 degrees. 
So a two degree temperature rise is associated with the CO2 doubling. Not two and a half degrees, not three degrees, not three and a half degrees, not nine degrees, like some of those things that are in the IPCC reports, it's two degrees, but it's also not 1.1 degrees, which you would get from the Stefan Boltzmann radiation law. It's two degrees, get over it. <clears throat> here is a graph, the same graph, but some other figures shown in here with hypothetical sensitivities of two and a half, three and three and a half degrees. You can see that the fit becomes pretty bad. I uh, recently updated the data from about 2008 to 2011, so I got more data here. Same kind of graph, and here I have shown um, some lines that are 2.06 degrees for the red line here, plus and minus 20% for the slope, and they're clearly out of bounds. And <clears throat> for the satellite data, I said, you know, you should, you should check things against the satellite data. The satellite data do not cover nearly as long a span. They only cover since December 1978. But they sample the Earth uniformly. Okay, and so I come up with essentially the same slope. The other one is 2.98 or something like, the, like that in the recent data. Uh, this case, the R squared is, uh, is only 48%, correlation 70%. But uh, you can see that plus or minus 20% on the slope gives you a pretty lousy fit. The second thing to notice is the high correlation coefficient, which is very high for climate date. Obviously, but not necessarily. What is obvious is not necessarily true. CO2 controls temperature almost single-handedly, which means that volcanoes aerosol use land use changes, varying cloud cover, varying solar flux, ocean currents, deforestation, yada da da da, are mere sideshows. Well, we know that's a, that's not can't be right because Willie gave me the data that shows that the Sunlight kind of handles about half of it. <clears throat> but anyway, the sensitivity or the, the correlation is that two degrees is associated with doubling of CO2 with very, very little uh, variance. But wait, there's more. Associated with is not the same as caused by. Now, I, this graph, this chart right here is from the IPCC. And they identify red as anthropogenic. And indeed, we have our fossil fuel burning and land use changes, according to them, are responsible for eight, that's uh, gigatons of carbon per year going into the atmosphere. Some of this won't quite pass the giggle test. <clears throat> Look at those numbers in red. Look at that number in red. Well, we'll just pay attention to these big ones. So we put eight gigatons every year, this is recent, into the, uh, into the air. And somehow that causes some 22 gigatons per year anthropogenic absorption by the oceans. and 20 gigatons per year anthropogenic emissions from the oceans. All right. you, you can't make this up. <clears throat> well, the IPC's logic is the following, that warming is anthropogenic, the warming oceans emit CO2, but they also absorb uh, more CO2 in the cooler uh, oceanic regions because there's a flux into and out of the ocean that's rather large. So the increased or, 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 or oceanic fluxes are anthropogenic. That's not due to Willie's fish swimming around, with or without mercury. And then they can later use this information to prove that climate change is anthropogenic. Okay, Henry's law has to do with, with gases going into liquids. And primarily, there's a direct proportionality between a gas concentration in the liquid and in the atmosphere. Uh, depending upon the temperature, the amount of uh, free CO2 is, about, okay, 
this is per unit volume. If you deal with bastard units, you're going to get numbers you cannot understand. But per unit volume, there is about as much CO2 as free CO2 in the ocean as there is in the atmosphere. Um, but there's a lot of CO2 tied up in carbonates and bicarbonates. It's about a hundred times as much as there is as free CO2. So if CO2 goes into the atmosphere from the ocean, the, the dynamics and so forth straightens things out. So it holds the oceanic free CO2 concentration approximately constant. And we, and we come up with uh, an equation that the concentration uh, rises exponentially with the, uh, with the temperature change. <clears throat> this is solu sol uh, CO2 solubility in water plotted uh, for a constant atmospheric concentration of whatever it was. I don't really know. It doesn't make a lot of difference because the atmospheric concentration and the, the w concentration in the water are proportional. Okay, so, but things are different when the oceanic CO2 is held constant. This one shows varying CO2 in the water when the atmospheric CO2 is held constant. We're dealing with a situation of the oceans in the atmosphere where the CO2 in the oceans is holding constant and the atmospheric part is, uh, is changing. So it rises exponentially and there's your equation C equals C0 E to the uh, delta T over some unknown constant tau. That constant tau is known well enough for pure water. What it's, it isn't, as far as I can see, and I've done a lot of looking, known very well for oceanic water. But anyway, if we take the logarithm of both sides, we get log of C over C0 is equal to delta T over tau, which becomes this equation down here. Now we have to compare these two equations. The upper equation says if the uh, concentration uh, uh, of CO2 in the air uh, increases from C0 to C, there is a temperature rise. That's the effect. The lower equation says if the temperature changes by an amount delta T, then the concentration changes from C0 to C. They got identical forms. except for the coefficient. The forms are the same, which means that that logarithmic plot I had, uh, it leaves a certain amount of ambiguity to it. So um, the, the graph has only one slope. We can't pick things apart and say uh, how much of that temperature rise is due to CO2 and how much CO2 rise is due to temperature rise. Well, you've only got one slope. And you've got unknown coefficients in both those equations. So you got the... Unknown doesn't mean unknowable. Uh, you are correct on that. Unknown doesn't know unknowable. And the, the, my plea to ignorance is I don't know. <laughs> but, but you're quite correct. Anyway, I'm <clears throat> I got this graph out of IPCC. Uh, my golly. And this led to the title of my talk eventually, until I found out something. Anyway, what I did was I said, you know, from about here on, all these curves agree pretty much. So I just read, read the data off from the red line and said, now I've got sea surface temperature. Now, we've been talking about water, about CO2 going from the oceans into the air. So sea surface temperature rather than air temperature is the relevant phenomenon. So I plotted, again, SST rise since 1910 against CO2 ratio since 1910, logarithm. Got a nice straight line in here. It's got a lot of noise down in here. Uh, got a pretty good correlation uh, there. Uh, matter of fact, it's rather remarkable. But from about here on, uh, the, the data really looked good. So I just took the data from 1962 on on the grounds that, well, 
they know a lot more about measuring sea surface temperature now than they did. They got better coverage and so forth. And so I took data from the last 50 years and I got an R square of 98%. Fantastic correlation. So we ask, well, why does this fit so good? Is it pure accident with a 98% R squared? No, I don't think so. One, one thing is there could be some crazy cause X we don't know about that controls both temperature and the CO2 logarithm. Another chance is that CO2 and virtually nothing else controls ocean temperature, or possibly the temperature, especially SST, and virtually nothing else controls atmospheric CO2 concentration. Okay, <clears throat> that means that lots of variables, solar variations, cloud cover, oceanic cycles, dust, aerosols, yada, 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 may affect the temperature, but the CO2 level responds to whatever the temperature is. No noise proves IPCC wrong. But there's another possibility. All that strongly contradicts IPCC, but the next option does also. The data are wrong. So I was talking with, I met Bill Gray at a conference and we'd been communicating by email. I was trying to convince him I was right and he said, those data don't look right to me. He studies the ocean. He's been studying it for 40 years, 50, long time. So <clears throat> I got the data from him about the NOAA. Here's the temperature record. This is a time series. Temperature record of the ocean according to, uh, to NOAA, National what? Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, right? And here's the IPCC curve. And there's a comparison. Uh, here I've got the SST from NO NOAA and uh, SST anomaly uh, from, the, uh, from that uh, IPCC curve. And uh, uh, that's what the thing looks like. That ought to have a slope of one. It has a slope of a half. And the IPCC data correlate with NOAA at only a 60% level. So I think that uh, I go with Bill Gray and the beautiful explanation I came up with has been destroyed by a brutal gang of facts. <clears throat> so anyway, now here is a cause effect graph with, uh, with the real SST data from, uh, from NOAA. And there's the logarithm, and the correlation is R squared of, again, about 35% uh, correlation, coefficient about 60%. Anyway, what does the noise tell us? Uh, the temperature rise is highly correlated with CO2 concentration. CO2 doubling is very strongly associated with a temperature rise of 2 degrees, but it doesn't say what the cause is. The low noise shows there's very little wiggle room. The SST data, extremely no noise uh, uh, in the IPCC, says that SST controls temperature uh, absolutely, or basically the IPCC's data are just plain wrong. Okay, the, the NOAA's SST data uh, associated doubling of CO2 with a 1.1 degree SST rise, which would be, or rather, which sort of what you would expect from the um, uh, uh, from the Stefan Boltzmann radiation law. Now I'm going to talk about um, Al Gore's speech. He says this, which is temperature uh, or CO2 change uh, causes the temperature to change. Now there are several things that are really quite wrong with this idea. The first thing is that anybody who has studied uh, climatology understands that this business of going into and out of the solar of the 
ice ages or the glacial periods of our long ice age has to do with the Milankovitch cycles. And the Milankovitch cycles are uh, planetary things having to do with the tilt of the Earth's axis. As we go around the sun, the axis points to the North Pole, but there is a slow precession like this with a period of 20-some thousand years. And there is a change in the tilt that has a period of about 41,000 years. And the shape of the orbit goes from more circular to a longer ellipse uh, with a period of about 100,000 years. And that's primarily the causes of those things right there. Now, this movie that Al Gore came up with came out well after the IPCC report. <clears throat> and nobody from the IPCC came up and said, Al Gore, you're wrong. Nobody from the IPCC came up and said, no, Al Gore is misleading the public and it's uh, leading to bad science, which is quite awful on their part. Yeah, I, I don't quarrel with that, but I, I'm not too good at politics. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay, but now here is the really nasty thing. I mean, suppose, suppose we take Al Gore's word that these, these changes over here in the CO2 cause changes in the temperature. Where did the CO2 come from? Where did it go? If CO2 was on the rise when the temperature was rising, let's see, plant life would have thrived and they'd have sucked the CO2 out of the air. Is that not correct? Where did it go? It went into the oceans. I thought they'd go into the oceans if the, if the oceans cooled down first. Now you've got to remember the first principle of causality is that the cause has to come before the effect. But then you say, okay, let's take Al Gore's word. How come the CO2 cycle follows the Milankovitch curves? Why would CO2 be related to the uh, tilt of the axis and the shape of the orbit and so forth? It's much more. Oh, that's it. <laughs> okay, we got it. Th that bell telling me I'm finished? In any case, there's nothing to get worried about. And as Pat Michael says, go find something useful to, to do. So. Okay, thank you for listening. <clears throat> yeah. I'll take any questions I can answer. Dick. Yeah. A bit. Um, I think your description of it, both on the alarmist side and on the Milankovitch side, are a little bit misleading. Uh, the alarmist side now referred and has long referred to CO2 as a feedback to Milankovitch, which causes the ice ages to be the magnitude they are. For a long time, the Milankovitch supporters had a problem. They were comparing the Milankovitch parameter, which is the solar incidence in the Arctic in summer, yes. with ice volume. And the correlation was actually poor. However, in 2003, some Swedish astronomers, young astronomers, realized something that was subsequently realized by a couple of Americans as well, that this was the wrong thing to look at. When you're looking at changes in the Milankovitch parameter, you don't compare them with ice volume, you compare them with the time derivative of the ice volume. 
That's an example of how primitive this subject is. I mean, it's a perfectly trivial thing. And they found first that the correlation was now superb, and two, that the insulation was sufficient to count for the change in ice volume thermodynamically. Mm. So at this stage, one has a quantitative theory for the ice ages, and it does not require any amplification. I'll touch on this briefly in my talk, because I'm not going to talk about Milankovitch, but that we're looking at the wrong variables, uh, including mean temperature. But it's not quite the simple picture you're pointing to. And, you know, long ago the alarmists realized the problem with the time lag lead on Gore and came up with another excuse. Okay. Thanks, Dick. <clears throat> This is another comment, but it'll be shorter. I've rarely seen it, uh, seen people refer to a point source of carbon dioxide that would look rather horrendous put up against the statistics. We have less than uh, 400 parts per million in uh, the atmosphere of carbon dioxide, yet this point source exert, uh, emits 50,000 parts per million. And that's the human being in tidal percentage of carbon dioxide. Uh, I'm a physician, I learned that in physiology many years ago, and it still is true. So at some point, somebody should engage uh, someone worried about carbon dioxide uh, and what should be done about these point sources. Yeah, I, I notice when I go out in the sunlight and breathe, uh, they, I get very warm. <laughs> I, th I think that Al Gore in his film either said explicitly or just implied that the uh, CO2 rise came first and the temperature rise afterwards. He said that, him. yeah. Um, and then someone pointed out, no, the lag went the other way, that the temperature rise came first and then the CO2 rise. But I've been seeing some some allusions in nature or science or one of those places that know that he was really right in some sense. And so I'm now totally confused about which came first and maybe some of these complications explain it. There was a recent paper in, I think, Nature, but I'm not sure, uh, where somebody had shown supposedly that the CO2 rise came before the temperature rise. But uh, the problem with that is like uh, some of the problems when uh, people are dealing with uh, the disappearance of Atlantis and the space people that came uh, and they, they conflate things that happened uh, thousands of years apart. But, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're <clears throat> the problem really was that the two sets of data that they were dealing with came from uh, uh, entirely different sources, and so they, uh, the time scale was not really that good. Well, in, no, I'll just talk into this thing. In, uh, when we were writing the review article on this for the petition project, uh, we looked at a paper written by Ravel and Seuss a long time ago in which they estimated the vapor pressure dependence of CO2 te of, on temperature temperature dependence of CO2 mm -hmm. on thermodynamically. They just had an estimate. Now there are experimental values, basically the vapor pressure of CO2 dependence on temperature over seawater. And when we were doing this, Noah looked at the Al Gore graph, you know, the ice core graph. And if you look at the temperature, the CO2 variation and the temperature variation throughout that graph of 600,000 years, you get exactly what you get in the laboratory for the vapor pressure of CO2 as a function of temperature over seawater. This is nothing but the vapor pressure change mm -hmm. of CO2 in the atmosphere as a function of temperature. Mm -hmm. And it's exact. It comes out exactly the same as the laboratory measured vapor pressure dependence of CO2. Good. Thanks. <clears throat> Just a quick question. How was it possible that this theory of Al Gore's ever got off the ground when, when you think about it,
we're really going from roughly three molecules of CO2 per 10,000 to four molecules of CO2 per 10,000. Is nature really that delicate that total global catastrophe could come about from one extra molecule per 10,000? How did this theory even gain any possible credibility to begin with? As I said, I don't do politics very well. <laughs> um, uh, well, it, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, uh, CO2 is, in fact, a greenhouse gas of some repute. Uh, I mean, it, it absorbs infrared, and it, it re-radiates infrared, and it bounces around, does all kinds of things. But, uh, I th you know, that's only just a very small part of the story. And, and in fact, it doesn't even explain uh, some very simple things, such as the fact that uh, you've got solar radiation coming down, hitting this thing and hitting that thing. Uh, they'll be at different temperatures because they're different color. But if it, so, so solar radiation came down and hit this one and hit this one that had some water spilled on it, the evaporation would keep this cooler than that. And in any circumstance, um, they, there's just plain never any balance between insulation and infrared radiation. There never is because the temperature would simply have to be way too high. Yeah, and so I don't know how it, how it gained traction. But uh, this is just one in a long list of scares that, uh, uh, well, I, who knows what the next one is going to be. Thank you. If I'm understanding you correctly, we can infer the opposite of what you were talking about 30 minutes ago. Instead of a doubling of CO2 causing 1.1 degree increase, uh, centigrade increase in surface temperature of the oceans, what this implies is that 1.2 degree centigrade increase in the surface temperature of the oceans causes a doubling of CO2. Is that correct? correct? Okay. Correct. You got it. Howard, I'm not a politician either, but I'll give you my opinion about uh, this, uh, why they pick CO2. They looked at the greenhouse gases, and of course the biggest one was uh, water vapor, but CO2 was one they could control. There we go, that was the problem. Well, it could be. <laughs> you heard the end justifies the Just an opinion. <laughs> I thought all this started with the coal miners' strike in Britain and Margaret Thatcher uh, promoting uh, any scientific idea that would have some influence on the course of the strike. Is, what do you know about that idea? Uh, <clears throat> well, that, that might be <laughs> pertaining to the, to, the, to the present one, but uh, there's a non-denumerably infinite number of scares that are brought up, <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you.